What's up, everybody? Informal Geek here, and today I'm going to be starting a series of videos um, highlighting my top 100 favorite uh, board games. I play a lot of board games. I've got a couple hundred uh, that I'm not showing you right now, but I've got, and I've played probably more than that since. And um, I've been entertaining the idea of putting a list like this together for a while, and I've done a couple of, of self-interested, like, just geek lists and stuff like that before. Um, but I never put it into a video format. I thought I would turn it into kind of like a game, kind of like a game. So what we're going to do is, um, I'm going to be, uh, let's put them buttons in play. There we go. So I've got a component or, um, a piece or something like that that represents, uh, a game hidden underneath these individual little, <laughs> I don't know what they call them, little things. I think I'm using the fog of war tool. And um, we're going to focus on just my bottom tier list, uh, my, my one, the number 100s all the way to the 91s. Wow, that was really hard to say. <laughs> I don't know why. So right here, I've got my number 100, number 91. And we're going to work our way all the way up until we get to number one. And I'll talk a little bit about what the game is first. But uh, like I said, we're going to make a game out of it. And so um, not very many rules, just one really. Um, if you want to let me know how well you did when you, cause I'm going to show you a component and you're going to try and see if you can guess yourself what that game actually is. And we'll, of course I'll talk about all of them, but I'm going to slowly show you all 10 of the games and see if you can, um, figure out what they are based off of the single component here. Now, if you can, or if, and if you want to let me know, you can go ahead and leave a comment, but if you're going to leave a comment, don't include the title of the game. In fact, if that's what you want to do and if you want to talk about a particular game, I would actually say don't leave a comment um, so that people watching this video at a late time can, can kind of play this for themselves without any spoilers. So yeah, just be diligent about that. Uh, you can let me know things like um, I got uh, 6 out of 10, for example. That, that would be more helpful. Um, otherwise, just enjoy and have fun and we'll talk about some really cool games. Um, I've got a mixture not a whole lot of really new games or a few um, and, a, and a good amount of games that have been that are either out of print or, or just games that I've that I think have passed the time have passed the test of time for me and a whole bunch of other stuff in between. So here we go. This is my number 100. Uh, how do I do this? Here we go. <laughs> nope, that's not what I want to do. How do I do this? Oh, I know how to do it. I'm going to have to delete button. <laughs> So we'll leave it down there and I'll zoom in and kind of pan through these as well. Um, but this is my number 100. See if you can recognize that game component if you've played these games before. Here's my number 99. And sorry for the pixelation, I do the best I can with what I have. Number, uh, number 98. Number 97. 96. 95, 94, 93, 92, and number 91. So I'm going to break them all down here for you now and let's kind of see if you guessed them right. So starting with my number 100, uh, this is a train game, but you wouldn't know if it was a train game just by looking at it, it's my favorite one so far that I played from Martin Wallace, and that's uh, Via Nebula. Uh, so this game here, let's actually make this a lot bigger so you can see it here. So in this game here, players are, um, they've got their own little dashboards with components and such, uh, but really it's a route building game. And so on the board, you you only have access to like knowing where certain resources are, but there's this fog and that you've got to clear out, and you've got some building sites as well. And so every turn you can you have a certain series of actions that you can take and one of them is clearing out the uh, fog by putting down clear meadow passages, eventually leading a route to given resources. Now there's a lot of different ways of scoring points in this game. It's if you know if you for example uncover this pig here, then um, let's see how many it, it said three pigs would show up here and that person would take this token it'd be worth one point at the end of the game. And so what you're trying to do is is connect routes to these resources, and then commit to building sites. And so you put a little token out there and it says, I'm gonna build this thing. 
but I'm not telling you what I'm building. I'm just building here. And slowly but surely, you're going to be um, rerouting resources from where they are to the building site and then eventually um, using the cards and playing the resources at the top of the cards uh, to build. Now, what makes this game really interactive and f or actually really fun is the interact in in interactions. You're not going to be able to complete a route all by yourself. You're going to rely on other players and you're going to be trying to time what you do around your players. Also, when you take resources and put them to your building site, they're locked in forever until you build there. And so if plans have to change and you have a resource there that you don't need anymore, uh, those are going to be turning into negative points at the end of the game. So it's pretty pretty tight. And it's also, um, I think, also aligns well with the, with the looks and aesthetic. It's actually not that hard to teach and play. Um, excuse me. It's one of those games that, you, you know, you have a lot of fun um, just interacting with it and then seeing how well you do. And it's like, all right, let's run it back again. That was a fun 45 minutes or an hour or so. Anyway, so that's my number 100 via Nebula. My number 99 here, just kind of referencing this token, is a really bizarre game. I haven't seen anything else like it ever, and that is Millennium Blades. So here's a picture, not from me. And by the way, I should mention, all of the images that you're going to see here are not taken from me. I pulled them from um, BoardGameGeek.com. There's a whole database full of information and, and also user-submitted pictures. So that's where I got these pictures from. And so in this game, when, when you actually set up the game and you play it, like a lot of this stuff is not actually out. A lot of this goes back in the box. Um, but it is a legit, let me show you the cover, CCG simulator, collectible card game simulator. And it's it's kind of nuts as an idea, but it works and it's, and it's kind of fun. Um, so all I want to talk about here real fast, or, or actually the only thing I want to talk about in this game is um, I've... I've actually taken one round and turned it into the full game. I don't think that's a variant in the rulebook, but I do it just for the sake of time because it's kind of a long game. But you've got these... Um, I have a rulebook here to help support this uh, this, this nuts here. So these are like all of the different decks that are in, 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 the, in the game. You always have a core set, you have your starter deck, and then you pick five, any five of these, any four of these, any three of these, and you shuffle them together and you get this massive deck of cards. Right, and you populate a store, and you go through a phase where you've got stacks of cash, which is which is comically um, paper money, but they're stickered together. So like this is always going to represent, I think five bucks or something like that, or, or something, you know, something like that. And uh, so you pay with stacks of maybe this one. <laughs> you just pay with these stacks of cash, and this is a real time phase. You think you've only got six minutes to do all of this in, so. You're like understanding what your cards are. Everyone's like ready, set, go, and then you're looking at the market and you're just buying them, right? As if you were, as if you were at one of these locations buying cards for an upcoming tournament, and uh, and then and you do that. You you can also have a player market. It's called an aftermarket, but players can take cards from their deck and that they and they can trade it with other players. Or more often than not, you're gonna put them down here and saying, I don't want this card. If anyone else wants it, you can pay me for it. And that's what these tokens are for, to indicate, I think, who who owns the card, who you have to pay. And there's a cost on the cards, and so you're, like, throwing cash. I'm, I'm taking this card. Here, take your money. And you just literally throw it at them. <laughs> that's the way we do it. We just kind of toss it their way. All right, here's here's a few bucks. Anyway, so this is really fun. Galaxy Trucker does something like this where you're building a ship in real time, except it's not as structured as this is. And so it can be pretty fun and hectic to build a card. And then the other half of that phase, when you're done with all of that, is you take whatever cards you have left over as your deck and you begin playing them out, kind of like a CCG would in a, in a tournament setting would, using their abilities and all the other kind of stuff that goes along with it, and then eventually seeing who has the most points based off of their uh, power totals. It's an insane game. It's super ambitious, but um, and maybe not an insane game, but it's definitely one of a kind. And uh, I love this game, so I had to put it on my list and ranking it all out. I just don't play it very often, which is why a game that I love so much is so low. Uh, uh, the number ninety nine. Anyways, that's Millennium Blades. Let me clean this up and get rid of that. Okay, number ninety eight is an interesting game. Let me just check something. So sorry. I think I've got someone at my door. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So uh, this game here is a game called Riverboat. Mm -hmm. I have another rule book here I want to use to demo something. 
Uh, this is from Michael Kiesling. This game did not get a lot of buzz when it came out. And it's a bit of a hodgepodge of a game, but it features a couple things that I really enjoy, which is um, action selection. Um, this is a little bit different. Like if you think of games that have action selection, like San Juan or Race for the Galaxy, um, Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition, these games um, there's a there's a set there's a uh, a selection of actions that you can take, and on your turn you pick one, and then you do it right. And so what this one does is it's very similar. You pick one that you want to do, uh, but they're always resolved in the same order, one through five. And so what players are doing basically is you're trying to, you have your own little player board and you've got these like locations right here. It's totally empty. And you've got your, your, um, I forget what they call them. They're not, I, I call them workers, but whatever you, you go out and you kind of select what areas you want to, uh, harvest or grow crops on. And then the next phase is where there's like a little bit of a drafting phase between tiles that have the, the crops on them. And you're, you're going all around the table taking turns doing this. So you, you know what people are going after and, and, and you might want to take something before they take it. It's very interactive in that way. And then, um, you know, you, there's another couple of phases. I, I don't remember what they are at the top of my head, but like um, you, you'll harvest and then you'll sell them. And then you get these surveyors, these green surveyors to kind of, you know, evaluate how well you're doing on your own terms you can put them on cards for scoring points or wells or barns anyways all you're trying to do is you go through four rounds of calling dibs and getting bonuses based off of the phase that you get shipping this stuff and just trying to get a bunch of points and it's, it's really fun but i don't think the artwork does itself a whole lot of favors um and uh yeah it's it, but it, i i really enjoy it i think it's it's a lot of fun and again it one of these games that you kind of have your own little player area, but this is definitely more interactive than, than other um, like multiplayer solid pair games that kind of do something similar. Anyways, that's Riverboat. Give it a check or, or yeah, give it, give it a check out and give it a try if you can. This one I feel like a lot of people are going to guess. This is Summoner Wars. I put the original Master Set. You can pick whichever one you like. Alliances, 2.0, Master Set, whatever. This is the one that I have a nostalgia play. Uh, uh, factor with um, and I really enjoy this one it's a two-player skirmish game um, it looks the way that I explain this is it's kind of like chess if chess had um, factions like if, if if black were a different faction and you had different shades of color pieces and they did different things and they had different setups the whole point is very similar though in chess you want to take out the king and summoner wars you want to take out the summoner except now you're dealing with special abilities and life points and range attacks and in movements and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I don't really mess around with any of the deck construction, although I know some serious gamers that would. Um, but what I like about this game is is that it does require some skill and strategy, long-term strategy, tactical play, and so on. But it's accessible to younger players because there is a luck factor left up into the into the resolution. You do have a little bit of dice resolution when you're attacking people, um, although. It's, it is weighted more on the hitting than it is missing, so it, it's just not fully deterministic. And because of that, this is a game that I can enjoy playing, and my kids also um, have a have like a fighting chance of doing well. Because you know it doesn't feel good to play a highly strategy game uh, with people that are not on the same level as you. And yeah, I really appreciate that in Summoner Wars. I'd have it higher on my list, but I, I don't I haven't really played it recently. All right, number 96 here is another older game, but um, again, I don't really know much about anything else that's kind of like it, uh, and that is Milestones. It's not that, I would not call this a looker <laughs> as well. Uh, it isn't in, in that older Euro style, uh, but in this game, and this is not the back of the box. This is just showing you what a player board would look like. Um, I don't think... No, I didn't, I, I didn't actually pull the rule book for this one. Um, but, um, basically what makes this game so fun is this, is this rondelle puzzle. So every turn you you start from here for the very, very, at the very beginning of the game, and you're allowed to do two moves and wherever you stop, you take the action, right? And what's fun about this puzzle is that these pieces are like, this is like way late game, by the way, you don't have really good pieces here. So if I imagine I stopped right there on this dude, I would get this white resource as well as any other white resources I passed on that turn. So I'd get a total of these of, of three white cubes if I ended my turn right there. And then maybe my second turn I would I would go um, there. 
So I'd get this cube and this cube, and then this gives me one extra victory point. Now it'd be my turn. My next turn, it would be my turn again, and I'd have to continue down here, and then go into the city phase and do things with it. If I go here, I can convert from like any two resources to a coin or coins to people, and you spend the coins to upgrade these slots. And so you're constantly trying to look at the available market and, and puzzle this together. Uh, you use your resources as a whole separate board of like routes and buildings that you can build and um, you get point. That's where you're going to primarily get a lot of your points. And the rub with this system is no matter if it's your first action or your second action, if you end, if you move here, that immediately ends your turn. Um, so timing, the, the timing of like, all right, well, I'm going to go here and here and then maybe I'll do another one of here and here and then I'll go here and then I'll go here. That's like three full rounds before you build anything and so you can you might actually lose the space you're going for and that's a that's a lot of tension that's fun in my opinion uh not a very hard teach as well but so it's a really good game i think i know it for sure i don't know for sure but i feel like it's out of print but i've seen it around in a lot of like after like secondhand sales and stuff like that i love this game i've had it for many many years and i'll probably keep it that way all right, next one is this icon here, and that is for Lords of Zidit. This one I did keep the rule book by because I want to show you something. Um, this game is known for um, having good artwork and being a programming game, but that's not what I love most about it. I don't, I mean, the artwork, yes, I do like, but I, I'm not, a, I do like programming style games, right? So every turn you have to set up your six actions and then everyone reveals and then acts them out. Um, in turn order like i like the drama of that but this is my favorite part at the very beginning of the game these three tokens are shuffled and randomized and put into the one two and three spots and this determines who wins the game so you'll play the game you'll and eventually the game will end and in this scenario here we score i think this is um reputation i, I forget which one's reputation and which one's influence i always get those two confused Let's just call it reputation for now. You, you look at your total reputation and you rank yourselves, right? And then you look at your total, um, well, I mean, we can do this any which way you want, but when uh, whoever's in last place, doesn't matter how much you have, whoever's in last place is fully eliminated from potentially winning the game, right? So for example, blue here or black here, actually this is a five player game. So in a five player game, it's the bottom two that get eliminated. So you can see black and blue uh, finish in last place and they're fully eliminated from the game. They cannot win. And then you go to the next one and you look at the, whoever's in last place here. And, and so at this point, yellow was not eliminated, but now they are eliminated. So they couldn't win the game. I mean, red is obviously the winner, but most of the times it doesn't work out that way. And usually by the time you get to third scoring, the winner is like the person who's in third place in this track. And so that balance of is so much fun because you don't want to, you definitely want to win in this category, but you have to survive these two. So you have to like, just not totally suck enough. And uh, that's a lot of fun. And I love that the most. Um, I wish I saw this in more games to determine winners, but uh, Lords of Zidit is the one that does it. And it looks really pretty. Of course, so it's easy to get played. It doesn't require, uh, it does have some, some length of strategy again. I think that's probably why it's 14 plus. Um, and it's, and <laughs> you can totally get hosed by this programming thing, but it's not like your whole plan is messed up. You just have to time things based off of what you think people are going after and stuff like that. And it's not as punishing as like Robo Rally, for example. And, uh, this game is, is, is a lot of fun as well. Definitely play it at four players though. I don't think five is as good. I think it takes too long and three is okay. It's, it's not bad, but it's just not as dramatic. And I think there's a two-player variant that adds a third-player dummy. I haven't played that one before. So that's another good one. All right, so we're going to jump over to our 94 here. And this is, an, uh, this is a confusing icon because it, it could mean a couple of games. But it's all in the same series. And uh, for me, it would be Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. So for Jaws of the Lion, um, I'm bundling this pick to capture Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, and Frosthaven. Out of those three games, I think I like Jaws of the Lion the most. Um, I think that they've cleaned up a little bit of the rules from Gloomhaven into this smaller package, so it is more accessible. One of the things that I don't like about this game is I wish there was more ways of changing characters uh, as you play the game. So that's something I do actually like better in those other games. Um, 
the story here is 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 okay. <laughs> it is still forgettable, but not as forgettable as Gloomhaven's, and probably not as good as Frosthaven's. Um, I just don't like Frosthaven's bloat with like the outpost phase and and stuff like that. I feel like every session I play, it's like four hours when I'd rather get out a game in ninety minutes. And so that's why for me, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion is my favorite uh, version of that, and that is my number ninety four. My number 93 is another older game. Um, the IP doesn't do it any any favors, I think, and that's Bioshock Infinite. Uh, this is not a game for a lot of people. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's, it's a pretty odd teach. Um, but the reason I picked this game is I think it's the best two versus two game. So in this picture here, you can see there are two shades of blue and there's two shades of red. And that... And that um, uh, each player can only control one shade of that color and you're on the team working together, but you are limited to only controlling your pieces when it's your turn. <clears throat> and what I'll, there's two things that I really like about this game is there's an ongoing NPC threat, which is super powerful. You don't want to mess, like you don't want to get in combat with that thing. It'll mess you up, but it's drawn to you based off of how well you're progressing as well. So how much more influence you have does draw its attention to you. Um, so that's fun. And then there's also, it's really fuzzy here, but there's a, every round there's an event type thing that players vote on. And, um, and depending on who wins the vote, certain things will happen that'll affect the round that turn. And so you might have a temporary alliance based off of what's mutually beneficial to each of you. Uh, and other times you won't. And, and anyways, it's an area control game. And the majority of the ways that you are going to win and end this game is based off of how many objectives that you have control over and you're trying to get them you know trying to have a certain number of them and that ends the game and you win but yeah it's a really fun 2v2 uh game i wish that it was at a different theme because i think this turns off a lot of people and the people that would be interested in it are not like this is not going to make you feel like you're playing the video game at all so this, this doesn't do itself any favors i hope they get to retheme this someday but that is my number 93 i think yes Bioshock Infinite. Number 92 is is Clank. Uh, this is a deck building style game that's very accessible for families. And uh, I'm going to show you the, uh, this is the artwork, by the way, for the, the game itself. It's a deck building adventure. Um, but, but it's a, um, it was one of the first, not the, not the first, I don't think, but definitely one of the early ones that I played that featured deck building. Uh, but it was, but it was more of a board game as well. Uh, most of the time you play deck building games, you just have cards in front of you. You play them at the end of your turn, you move on. And here you're that you're progressing everything you're doing on a board. And the premise here is to start at the top of the castle, you work your way into the caverns, into the where all of the the treasures and loots are, and you're trying to do so without generating um, much noise, no, aka clank. And as more noise is generated, it goes into a bag, and when the dragon awakes, it attacks. And if you if your pieces get picked, you take damage. So you could be eliminated based off of that damage. So you're trying to manage um, the noise you make as as a resource, which is very interesting. And it, like I said, it's a race, so you're trying to get in, get a good amount of gold and loot and and stuff like that, treasures, and then make yourself uh, then leave. Now, if you can leave successfully, you're going to get a bunch of points as well, but that triggers this really aggressive uh, moment where the dragon's kind of progressing itself out towards the cave. But that, it doesn't, it's more like imaginary thematic in this picture. Um, but it's so fun to like get out somewhat early and not, not totally early. I don't like that strategy. I don't think it works, but um, if you are relatively doing well and you're the first one out, you're just kind of rooting on for the dragon to just kill everybody, um, because if they, if if anyone does get defeated before they cross this threshold, no matter how much victory points they have, their final score of the game is zero. And if they can, and then if they do lose all their life, but they're in this realm here, then they can still add up their scores normally. But if you can make it yourself all the way to the top here, you, I think you get like an extra twenty points. So it's definitely worth it. So you're constantly left. You know, trying to make the best decisions based off of the cards that you're getting because you're limited by, by your the cards that you draw. You can only move based on how many 
of those foot icons that you draw in this in this hand here you're probably doing some attacking and you're buying some new cards you're not moving very far at all so you're trying to like really pay attention to the deck building and it's such a good and fun uh, accessible game um it, unfortunately the base game only has one map i think that's a big downsell or downfall because you do have to buy a couple of expansions to get some more stuff going on but um i haven't played clank catacombs which is the newest iteration of the series uh, which features a dynamic uh, map, a map, and I'm wondering if I play that, if that would replace this game for me, and definitely be higher on the list. But for now, um, I played uh, Clank. And this, by the way, I played Clank in Space, and I do like that game, but I just like this one more. So you're not going to see Clank in Space um, separately on this list. And finally, for my number one is a game that I enjoy playing with my wife so much, and that is Cupcake Empire. It has really cool art, by the way. And um, I, um, it does make itself uh, to appear pretty attractive in that way. Uh, but it's a dice game, and it's a fast dice game, too. My only major complaint with this game is that the components are just too small, especially the, uh, the little factories that you're building. Um, but despite the enormous amount of icons here, uh, what you're doing is you're taking where you have uh, influence and selling your cupcakes to the people there. And uh, if and and the and the people, like this is all randomly um, sorted and determined when you set up the game, and based off of their shirt and pant color determines what cupcakes they're interested in. So like this dude here, he's gonna want a strawberry, a topping that has strawberry, and the base of the cupcake being vanilla. So there are mixed ingredients and mixed of these as well. There's five in all, so you've got variations of lemon, uh, mint, strawberry, and chocolate. Uh, and you can mix those together and anyways, it's it's a dice game though So you are limited to what you roll and you're trying to get your same If you can get lucky enough to get the same colors to line up in the columns and you get better actions um, And uh, and it does ramp up super fast because just like in sub games like suburbia You have these two tracks that you're trying to manage and every round you always score Points equal to whatever your lowest value is of these tracks. So you're like Doing things to get your production up and then doing things to get your income up and then next thing you know you're scoring 12 points around <laughs> so it's a lot of fun there's a little bit of competitiveness but because i played at two players we don't really get to see a lot of it um, i would say this gives a much tighter game at three or four but as a two-player couples game um, again despite some of the tiny pieces in the game and i think the rule book is could be better um, me and my wife we really enjoy this one and it again knocks out in like half an hour Anyways, that is my 100 to 91. So I will show you these again and feel free to let me know how many you got correct. And if you, again, just as another disclaimer, if you put that in the comment, please don't include any of the game's names and just let me know what kind of numbers you got out of it. And if you have, um, you feel free to throw things out there like, oh man, I've I can't believe you rated um, number your your number ninety seven so low, or I've never even heard of, you know, your number ninety three. That's crazy. I hope I find it too. So that'd be fun to know. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this iteration, this first step of this uh, top one hundred. And uh, in my next video, we'll cover games ninety to eighty one. Thanks for watching. Bye.